Thank you all for coming. Thank you for having me. Uh, I know it is just after lunch. I'm afraid I don't have any uh, kittens or unicorns or rainbows to keep you entertained, but there is one puppy at the end, so you have something to look forward to. I'm here to talk about sampling traffic. Uh, I will give you a brief overview of uh, what sampling is. I know basically, I'm, I'm sure most of you already know, we mean a lot of different things when we use the word, so I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. My name is Ben Hartshorn. I work for Honeycomb. Uh, this talk is not about Honeycomb, but I do use uh, a number of graphs from our product to illustrate certain ideas. Uh, there are other, plenty of other um, uh, systems that accept sampling in the same way that I'm talking about, uh, so I believe it can be applicable. Uh, and I would like to see more systems doing this as we move along. Uh, I think it's the, the best way to, um, to, to be able to reduce the amount of traffic you're, you're dealing with. So at the most basic level, what I mean by sampling is something that is not new by any stretch. Science has been doing this for years, decades, I don't know, centuries. Um, you want to take a smaller section of your population and believe that that will represent the larger population so that you can look at a small set of things and understand patterns you see in the, the larger uh, system that you're trying to understand. Now, science has it rough. Um, they can't look at everything. If you want to know what the temperature is in San Francisco, you cannot measure the temperature at every single place in San Francisco. We run servers. We can. We have all that data. Every one of our machines could be giving us all of the data about everything that it's doing, and it would overwhelm us. For those of us that are working in a business setting and not doing research or other uh, uh, different use cases, um, it's simply not feasible to run an observability infrastructure that is the same size as your production infrastructure. It doesn't make sense. You'll be burning money that you should be better spent uh, doing other things. So we need to reduce the total amount of data that we are going to be looking at when trying to understand what's going on. We could measure fewer things. Nobody wants to do this. We can aggregate the data before sending it into our observability infrastructure. This is what metrics do. They do it very well. I'm not talking about that today. We can send samples. Sampling, so uh, imagine a web server. There are um, you know, 20 requests coming in. You want to look at a sample. I'm going to select one in five. And there are a couple of things about the selection. Uh, you should select them randomly. If you try and follow a pattern and say, you know, I'm going to take this one, then ignore four, then take this one, then ignore four, you will create patterns in your data that are not there, and you will miss patterns that are there. Uh, taking a random selection helps smooth out some of that bit. Um, and uh, statistics are in our favor. Even the things that occur infrequently, uh, we'll catch them eventually. But there's another issue with sampling, and that's that, you know, we sometimes care about those things that happen infrequently more than we care about the things that happen frequently. Uh, classic is uh, errors. You know, we, it is more interesting for us as operators of production infrastructure to understand when an error happens than when a successful request goes through. Or maybe you're looking at writes and reads. Or there's some other aspect of your traffic that is relevant to your business that makes you care about that traffic more than you care about other traffic. And uh, so people say, uh, I don't want to miss those edge cases. I'm just going to collect everything and, and um, deal with the, the side effects of that. I think we, can, we do have an advantage over science that has to be impartial. We can impose those goals and our desires about which traffic is more important on the samples that we create. We can choose aspects of the traffic that we're looking at and say, this, this part here is an indicator of how interesting this traffic is going to be to me, and I'm going to use that to influence whether or not I am collecting that as part of my sample. Uh, what you use to, um, to, to make this selection is uh, dependent upon the goals of 
the service that you're running uh, for a web server. A status code is, is certainly useful. Uh, perhaps the, there are some uh, endpoints in your um, in your service that are more interesting than others or you care more about. This is a good way of collecting for writes or reads or individual customers that might be uh, of particular interest. So we can choose some or many of these together to influence uh, whether or not we're going to choose our traffic. The math is a little bit scary when you start talking about sampling traffic at different rates, but it's not actually terrible. Computers happen to be very good at it. So the catch is that you must record, along with every sample that you collect, the sample rate at which you are collecting it. So if I choose some traffic is going to be sampled heavily and other traffic less heavily, if I'm going to compute the average of some aspect of this traffic that is not influencing the sample rate, I need to take those rates and uh, use them to influence the math that I'm doing. Now, uh, hopefully the, uh, the observability framework you're working with supports this. Many do. Uh, some don't. Um, but uh, I, I'm sure that uh, as time goes on, more will. So. Um, this is something that we're, I'm just going to take for granted, that uh, we, we can include the sample rate along with each message we send along, and it will be used to influence the math so that everything works out correctly. Nobody wants to be sitting there staring at a graph and thinking, oh, I need to multiply that one by two because I sampled that at 50% and so on. So a couple of details just to make sure we're all clear. When I'm talking about sampling, it's uh, events coming out of a infrastructure or a production system or a service that represents some unit of work. It has many fields, some of which we can use to influence whether or not that record is interesting. Minor pet peeve um, really bugs me when people talk about sampling using percentage. Our goal is not to, you know, reduce by 12% the amount of traffic, the, the size of our observability cluster over over production. We're aiming for orders of magnitude. And the usable range of numbers in percent is essentially 0 to 100. We're throwing out most of that. So please, just use ratios when talking about sampling. Uh, it makes everything easier. 1 to 20, 1 to 50, 1 to 10,000 is just, I, I like it better, excuse me. Uh, and I, I don't want to be thinking about 0 0.00025 as my sample rate. I mentioned uh, t choosing your elements randomly in order to ensure that, uh, that that you're not creating patterns. Now, that seems to be in conflict with uh, using the content in order to influence sampling. What I mean is within a category that I have, I have described, OK, I'm going to sample 200s uh, at this rate, you know, HTTP 200 status code at this rate. Uh, those must be chosen randomly in order to ensure that you're not creating patterns. You have to communicate this choice to your observability infrastructure so that you don't need to do math. You let the machines do it. And that has to be on a per event basis in order for the math to work out if you want to adjust your sample rates in any way more interesting than just a, a fixed rate. So uh, there are many ways to choose what you should sample. I've collected a few out of uh, two different sampling libraries, one that we wrote at Honeycomb. Another is the uh, Jaeger uh, open tracing implementation out of uh, Uber. They have uh, slightly different constraints, but uh, I really appreciate that many of the algorithms are, in fact, the same between the two libraries, despite them being uh, created with, with slightly different goals. The code for all of these are available on GitHub. Uh, I forgot to mention at the beginning, the slides are up uh, and um, will be after this talk. Uh, all of these URLs will be available there. So right into it. The simplest sample rate is one we've already talked about, a, a fixed rate. I'm going to take one out of every 50 events that goes through the system, and I'm going to use that to uh, believe that it represents the, the traffic that I see. When the traffic you're looking at does not have a lot of characteristics that allow you to understand whether or not it is more or less interesting, this is a perfectly viable method for selecting the samples you're going to take. It's easy. It's fast. Uh, 
but it doesn't give you much more insight into your traffic other than uh, simply reducing its volume. Now, I'm going to skip over a few of these because uh, I want to make sure we have time for questions and so on. Um, but I'll come back to, to some that are, are more interesting in a little bit. Um, the next I want to discuss is taking this, this static sample rate just a little bit further. We're going to use static sample rate. We as people are going to configure our system to measure different traffic at different rates. An excellent example is HTTP status codes. Uh, I want to sample all successful requests at a ratio of 1 to 1,000. And any errors that come through, I want to see. So uh, I'm going to examine the HTTP status code on its way out of the web server. If it's in the 200 range, I will sample it at 1 to, two, one to 1,000, send 1 in 1,000 events through to my observability system. If the code is in the 500 range, I'm going to send it no matter what. So without adding too much complexity, this is something that is easily configured in an Nginx config file or a Varnish config file or, or uh, uh, in Logstash or something like that. Um, without adding very much actual logic to any of the, the applications, you suddenly have gotten rid of the biggest downside that people complain about when they think about sampling. When somebody gets an error, I need to know about it, so I can't sample. Well, you can. You just need to use whether or not it's an error to influence whether or not you're choosing to sample that, that event. OK, so that's easy, but it's a, a significant step beyond uh, just using a single, um, a single sample rate. But we have computers, and they're good at math, and they understand the systems they're going through. So I want to talk about one that's a little bit more interesting a little more complex, a little more difficult, fantastically more powerful. Your server, uh, let's use a web server as an example, an application server. Um, it sees all the traffic that's coming through. You have an HTTP handler. It answers requests. It dispatches the traffic. Your service does things. It hands back a result to, uh, to the client. On the way back, uh, it has a number of interesting attributes for your traffic that uh, you care about. One of those is status code. One of them is uh, the, the specific database shard that ran your traffic, uh, that, that ran your, your process. Um, you can use both. And you can allow the server to choose the sample rate by observing the frequency of traffic going through it. So in times when your traffic is low, uh, your, your server looks at that and says, OK, you know what? I'm only getting 50 requests per second. That's fine. That's within my threshold. I'm just going to send them all. You get a spike of traffic. You're now at 5,000 requests per second. It thinks, yeah, this is a bit much. I'm going to dial up that sample rate. Uh, because the sample rate is being included with every event, it can change all the time. The math doesn't change. But the ability of your infrastructure to handle changes in load or different types of traffic without overwhelming your observability infrastructure has suddenly uh, increased dramatically. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated because uh, essentially it, it needs to use some extra memory. It needs to maintain some awareness of uh, not just the current record it's working on, but uh, what the traffic patterns look like in order to influence <laughs> that sample rate. Uh, but it's not a whole lot of code. Uh, it's, it's well within uh, most. Applica uh, applications to, to manage this sort of thing. I'll give you some examples of what this looks like uh, in a little bit. It's my favorite of all of them. Uh, it's the one we use at, at, uh, at Honeycomb. Um, you don't need to use these in isolation. Uh, I didn't talk about the, the rate limiting um, sampling method, but uh, I mean, in, in brief, uh, you let the first five results through, and then you just sort of keep an awareness of how many are going on. And, and uh, then the next, next time period, you can let another few through, adjusting the sample rate as you go. Um, it's really interesting to combine that with some of these others to say, you know what, uh, most of the time I'm not going to sample at all. But if I exceed some limit, then I'm going to start sampling. Uh, this is a, a way of, of um, adapting your sampling algorithm based on the qualities of the traffic that are going through even beyond uh, just 
a, a single algorithm, um, it, it can get a little bit more complicated as these two interact in ways maybe you didn't expect. And there are plenty more. Uh, there are more in code in both the, uh, the um, DIN sampler and the Jaeger sampling <coughs> libraries. Uh, they are well described in comments. Um, also, uh, on the, the Honeycomb blog, I, we, we talk about uh, sampling quite a bit. So I encourage you to go uh, look those up and, and dig around, see what sorts of ideas it, uh, it pops up. So what does this look like? Um, here on the, uh, the top graph, I have the, uh, the volume of three types of traffic coming in. One is much higher than the other two. Uh, of the two lower ones, one is, is, uh, has some periodicity to it. You see there's a, a bunch of little spikes dropping out. Um, the bottom three graphs are visualizations of the sample rate chosen for that traffic based on the volume. Now this is a, from a fleet of maybe 40 servers, so uh, they're each making their choices independently using uh, the same algorithm, so they all sort of cluster around the same value. But uh, you can see that the noisiness of the traffic of the top line uh, correlates to some noisiness within the sample rate there. Um, all three of the bottom graphs are on the same y-axis. So you can see the, the relative values, even if the legend is, is too small. Uh, and the third one, of course, has the lowest sample rate, but they're all sort of distributed a bit, and we're allowing the server to manage uh, what, how much it sends based on this, this understanding that uh, you know, different volumes of traffic, uh, that the higher volume traffic can, can be safely sampled more heavily. Compared to three different sources of traffic being sampled at three different rates, this is one source of traffic that varies in volume over time. So again, the top graph is the, uh, the volume of traffic coming through. The bottom is the sample rate chosen. Uh, and I, I think it's a very pretty graph. Um, but it illustrates this same idea of adapting your sample rate as you are watching your traffic so that uh, you can you can make sure to, to keep the, the volume of traffic going to your observability system low enough to uh, scale it roughly logarithmically with your production infrastructure. So the best type of traffic to, deal, to, to create these kinds of pretty graphs is when you can choose to break down your traffic on some variable that gives a power law or, or a, a, a logarithmic distribution of values. So in this graph, the scale uh, on the y-axis is logarithmic. Each tick is a, a power of 10 beyond the previous. Um, so if you can identify these sorts of patterns in your traffic and use that to influence the sample rate, so long as this, uh, this distinction is of interest to you running the system, what you get is uh, a, the same power law reduction in total volume coming out of your production infrastructure going into your observability stack based on this graph. So you can see all those tiny little things going on that hit once or twice in, uh, that are very rare uh, in a way that is not obscured by the tens of thousands of events running through your, per second running through your system. Okay, a couple of examples of uh, implementations of this idea. Um, Honeytail is a, a log tailing agent that we wrote at Honeycomb. Uh, you can throw different types of logs at it. Uh, you can see the pretty logos on the left. Um, in order to influence what's interesting to you as you are consuming these logs and reduce their volume, uh, Honeytail accepts flags that will tell it, hey, these individual fields within these log types are what I would like you to use to influence the sampling. So for example, if you are uh, parsing uh, a MySQL slow query log, um, perhaps the, uh, the, the comment field which you've added to uh, your queries indicating the, the file and line from which this thing is being called is an interesting uh, component in order to say, I want at least one record of every different type of call my code makes out to the database. And I know that I have this hot loop over here that's issuing thousands of requests per second. I don't want that to overwhelm the entire graph. 
ah nginx apache, we already talked about http status codes obviously, if it's parsing raw json, it's entirely up to you whatever the traffic looks like the jaeger distributed tracing system has a slightly different constraint in that it has this the the agent running on different servers that can't coordinate, but it wants to make the same decision about whether to sample a trace on all nodes so there have been a couple of talks about open tracing i won't get into it beyond saying there's a concept of a trace which is the entire execution through your entire service and a span which is the the result of either one network hopper or one server or some subcomponent of code and you want every member of a trace to make the same decision about whether they should sample spans or not the solution that that jaeger uses is to assign the trace id when the when the the trace has begun propagate that trace id everywhere and instead of using a random number generated to choose yes or no i'm going to sample the span it uses the trace id and its position on a range knowing that all trace ids are zero to some maximum if you want you know five percent sample rate if the trace id is in the bottom five percent given that the trace id is randomly generated you have a random sample and every node can make the same decision at the same time they have some interesting stubs in there in order to accommodate extra influence what the operation is uh, is the the flag the, the name for the variable they're using uh, some of that some of their algorithms don't yet honor that flag uh, but I know it's work that they're interested in doing there are a couple of github issues talking about it uh, and if you are interested in contributing that is an area that uh, definitely needs needs a couple extra hands I want to talk a little bit more about our API server um, because it's got a fantastically uh, diverse collection of traffic coming in and it's an example of combining some of these signals together in order to form uh, in order to make the decision so the traffic coming in uh, as, as is not uncommon for young startup companies like ours uh, the there is a small percentage of customers that send the majority of traffic we want to care about all of our customers equally so we want to be able to see everybody's traffic regardless of whether they are an order of magnitude or two or three below the uh, the highest volume traffic there are a few different types of requests that our API server handles some very frequent some very infrequent we want to see both types so we use a combination of the HTTP method status uh, data set is a, a unit of um, of interaction with honeycomb as a service uh, customers send data into data sets so that effectively identifies uh, customer and um, a, a particular type of their traffic within their their team uh, and the URL there isn't a lot of variation there uh, because it's a rest API so we can safely use it uh, to, to differentiate traffic now the technical effects of using those four elements as the keys are that uh, high volume data sets and low volume data sets both get through the sampling filter so I can I can see those um, errors are caught through the HTTP status code uh, the same URL for a get or a post is sampled differently so that I can understand reads versus writes but the business side of why that's interesting are that I can understand when somebody is trying us out what their experience is so I'm sure any of you that that have worked for platforms have had the experience where some large and and uh, potentially very valuable customer comes along and says um, you know I, I want to try out your service I you know I set up a, a little playground app you know I'm sending you two requests per minute um, you know it seems really slow what's going on and you're like sorry you know you're not one of our top 20 customers sending us a bajillion messages per second um, I have no idea what's going on uh, I'll get back to you in a few hours I'm gonna go pour through our logs and uh, you know look line by line and see if I can find anything and that's no fun for anybody involved but by using the uh, indicator of customer as an influence of the sample rate suddenly despite the fact they're only sending me two events per second 
or per minute or per hour each of those are represented in our dog fooding cluster. and i can go in there and understand, oh, look i can see that you had an authorization issue here because there's some bit of your of your thing that was malformed and and we can look into that and and solve your problem for you as a the, so that's the, the most important from the business uh, is being able to understand on a per customer basis what their user experience is like uh, there are also a few signals that we toss in there for ourselves for example um, there's there's uh, some some stages of uh, uh, data that, that come in user agent, for example. Um, it's helpful to know uh, when somebody sends us a little bit of data uh, what platform they're coming from. Uh, user agent is not one of the elements that I chose to differentiate traffic there, because within a data set, it's pretty consistent. So not really necessary. That level of specificity has already been achieved. OK, uh, just, to, just to recap. Um, in order to get good insight into individual customer experience and understand the performance of your system at a micro and macro level, you want to record context-laden wide events that represent everything about uh, how your service is working. And there's too many, so you sample them. You use a sample rate that is uh, influenced by uh, characteristics of that traffic that are relevant to you as operators and you as a business. And then you can enable your developers to build great things easily, quickly, iterate on them faster, better, safer, more secure, more stable. Um, you don't get unicorns at the end, but you do get puppies. So thank you very much. OK. That's the presentation. And we'll have another one coming up in about two or three minutes. Thanks. We have about one or two minutes left for questions. Go right ahead. Thank you very much. Thanks. So um, <clears throat> in the situation where you're sampling, I imagine that there are situations where you may get it wrong. You know, you've gotten your, your algorithm set up, and you missed some critical messages that now you can't figure out why this thing broke. Uh, in your experience, does this tend to lend to like a two-tier system, where you might have a bulk system where you put all the logs but then you maybe only send your sample data to something where you're doing more uh, you know, live dashboards or something with it. So that way, if you missed it in your observability system, you can still go back to your bulk data collection and go, go grep it out of there. Uh, so I've got two answers for you. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, uh, first one is yes. I expect every company as they grow to start with one system or two and wind up having at least a metric system, an event system, a data warehouse, uh, probably you know some S3 bucket where you stash everything and, and set Amazon's expire after seven years flag. Um, it certainly there, there are uh, definite use cases, especially depending upon the, the the business need to find out exactly what happened when I forgot. The second answer is that you know maybe don't bother and just change the sampling algorithm so you can catch it next time. That's where the business comes in to help decide which of those is right. Uh, if you're running a billing system, yeah, keep an extra log. Uh, if you're just, uh, you know, if it's an error that you know is going to happen again, maybe it's okay to wait. So uh, I wouldn't be surprised if eventually everybody winds up doing what you're describing with multiple systems, with different resolution, different types. Uh, and in between there, it's up to you. Thank you. Okay, thanks one more time to David Hartzorn.